Wow. Thank you, Kate and Elise and Erica. That's kind of an amazing introduction. I have to live up to that. And thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be reading the Kazan. I'm going to start off with... Um, I'm going to start off with reading a, a little bit from my new book. These are somatic exercises. Um, what happened basically, I'm just very sh briefly, in um, 2005, I was visiting my family, and everybody in my family is, uh, they're factory workers. And um, they, all used to, they all worked in the same factory until NAFTA, it was a coffin factory. And uh, that was very cheerful. And then, uh, but now they work in, you know, dental floss factories, cardboard box factories, and I just don't want to work in a factory. And I never have liked the idea of working in a factory. Just, ever since I was a child, I was like, I am not working in these factories. And when I went to this reunion in 2005, that's all they talk about are their jobs and who works more overtime, and it was just, oh. But when I left on the train ride home to Philadelphia, I realized just in a moment, just sort of an epiphany, this flash, that I was treating my poetry the same way, this assembly line, and it, and it really upset me, and I didn't write for a little while, and I, was, I thought, maybe I'm just going to stop. But I didn't want to stop, so I, I sort of reinvented what I was doing, and so I created these, these structures, these somatic exercises, they're, they're what I call extreme present, I create these rituals that once I'm inside of them, going through the ritual to, to find the notes, to create the poems, I can't be anything but present. So um, this book is uh, 27 uh, exercises. The exercises, this is Wave Books put this out. And um, I love the book so much. It's 100% recycled paper, even the cover. But the exercises are on black pages, and then the resulting poems are on white. Pages. So I'm going to read. There, and you know, there were there, a lot of challenges came to me when I started this process in 2005, because I said, um, I said to myself, "Well, I can turn anything into a poem. I can make this work, um, no matter what it is." And um, and I was held up at. Um, I was held up at knife point. And I said, um, I'm going to make this work. And uh, these four men loved me at knife point. And on the subway ride home, I thought, I'm going to turn this into a somatic exercise to write poems. And um, every morning for a fortnight, I would wake up and do these uh, rituals, these sort of life-affirming rituals. But part of the, the ritual involved um, predicting my death. So it's 14 poems where I predict my death at the beginning of each poem. I'm just going to read one of those poems. So each one of them starts off with the prediction of death, guessing my death. One. By choking in 11 years, 4 months, 2 weeks, 6 days, 12, 18 p.m. When I win the lottery, I want my legs amputated, and two beautiful peg legs wouldn't, of course. Frank Sherlock says it's a very bad idea. He says I should reconsider, seriously reconsider. I want peg legs, but he says I'll regret it. He might be right. But what I really want is to have my real legs, the ones I don't want, cremated, because what I really want is to scatter my own ashes. I thought about getting liposuction and having the fat cremated, but it's not the same, because I can eat more delicious donuts and grow it back. It doesn't count. It has to be something missing for good, you know. But to spread my own ashes is something I love thinking about and the cheerful sound of my peg legs on Philadelphia sidewalks. <laughs> so the book opens with um, asking you to visit the home of a deceased poet whose work you admire. And for me, that was Emily Dickinson. I, um, I grew up in a very uh, impoverished part of rural Pennsylvania. And uh, <coughs> the library well, every library in America has Emily Dickinson, so that's where I got started. And, and I had my own idea about her. And then teachers, as I got older, started talking about her, and they didn't like anything that they had to say about her. Yeah. 
<laughs> I started to paint her in a corner for me as this wilting lily, you know. But it's just not possible that she was. I mean, to have, uh, to be a poet and have centuries of poetry walk up to your door and you reject it all for something new, which is what she did. This is why she is still with us today. That takes courage. I mean, it's just ridiculous to think that she's anything but courageous. So I'm going to read the exercise first for this one. And um, come on in before I get started. Are there seats for this? There's seats over there in the corner that the picture is Got it? All right. So the exercise is called Anoint Thyself. Visit the home of a deceased poet you admire and bring some natural thing back with you. I went to Emily Dickinson's house the day after a reading event with my friend Susie Timmons. I scraped dirt from the foot of huge trees in the backyard into a little pot. We then drove into the woods where we found miniature pears, apples, and cherries to eat. I meditated in the arms of an oak tree with the pot of Emily's dirt, wetting to waking to the flutter of a red cardinal on a branch a foot or so from my face, staring, showing me his little tongue. When I returned to Philadelphia, I didn't shower for three days, then rubbed Emily's dirt all over my body, kneaded her rich Massachusetts soil deeply into my flesh. They put on my clothes and went out into the world. Every once in a while, I stuck my nose inside the neck of my shirt to inhale her delicious, sweet earth covering me. So you get the idea walking around with Emily Certain and taking notes. And then this is the resulting poem. And it's called, Emily Dickinson Came to Earth, and Then She Left. Your sweaty party dress and my sweaty party dress lasted a few minutes until the tomato was gone. Someday they will disambiguate you, but not while I'm around. Our species won, Emily. We won. It feels so good to be winning. The flame of victory passes it around and never goes out. Dinosaurs ruled Massachusetts. Dinosaurs fucking and laying eggs in Amherst, Boston, Mount Holyoke. Then you appeared, High Priestess, pulling it out of the goddamn garden with both hands. You, Emily, remember the first time comprehending a struck match can spread a flame. It feels good to win this fair and square. Protest my assessment all you want, but not needing to dream is like not needing to see the world awaken to itself. Indestructible epiphanies consume the past. And just because you're having fun doesn't mean you're not going to die. Recrimination is the fruit to defy with unexpected appetite. I will be your outsider if that's how you need me. Electric company's stupid threatening letters cannot affect a poet who has faced death. So I thought I'd read um, a couple of new pieces, somatics. I'm going to read uh, two poems from a series that I completed, I, I was very fortunate to, um, to take part in a, um, an amazing residency in Wyoming, a place called U-Cross. And I was there for a month, and um, every evening I would watch the stars come up. And this was my proposal to them, and they liked it, so I was like, well, I almost didn't think they were going to do this, but I said, I'm going to watch the stars come up every evening, I'm going to create my own constellations, a series of constellations. And I will, um, it was very, I don't want to get into all the details, but, and then I would create mythologies around those constellations, and I would take notes late into the evening, and when I would wake up in the morning, I would type them up into a single document. And then they bring your lunch to you, which is just wonderful. <laughs> and it's so decadent. And, um, and there's always a piece of fruit in there. And I was doing all this research on water molecule absorption of sound. So I would take the fruit and I'd put it on the floor with my laptop. And I would play a track from Missy Mazzulli's uh, Victoire Band CD, uh, Cathedral City, as loud as I could. And I would cover up the laptop and the fruit with a basket. And then layer that with blankets and towels and pillows and a comforter. And then as soon as it was finished, I would eat the fruit very quickly. And then I would begin editing. And these are the directions on how to get here from Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read two of these. 
Oh, and the, this whole this whole series is now a chat book, and it's um, free and it's online. And this particular poem I'm going to read. There's um, on the desk over there. Um, there's a, a stack of these for free behind the uh, for, uh, beautiful marsupial afternoon book. It's called Head Out Window on the Baptism Highway. Shake tall buildings out of my loving you. Down far, down far, far down by a rock at the water. Finish cooking soup with violins. Everything could use a melody to set it right, mitigate suffering. You care. You cannot with success deny needing violins. Okay, trombones. The trombones enter the pasta entering our bodies. The microscope shows there is song between the grains. The wind the weed endured is a taste the animal carries forward. Immersion of hours through a loosening bone. We are without the timing of the beetle. A sound that cannot get to where we left our homes in shame. So, um, this January 1st is my 25th anniversary of being a vegetarian. And um, being in Wyoming for this residency, there was so much meat. I was the only vegetarian within hundreds of miles. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, the chef would have, the chef was great, she'd make, make sure that I had food that I could eat, but there'd just be like an actual half of a animal oh. on the table. Yeah, so this is some, so that came up occasionally when I was writing. This one is called, Be a monster to anyone who is cruel to animals and I will love you always. For Summer Browning. Let's sit on this bench for 24 hours, not telling them where we are. You can gum up the engine while I look for more time in my bag. There will never be another golden age, you say. What a relief, I say. You smile finally. Olfactory nerves slowly bend one way, then another by the rose. Give me this planet as a friend, and I will show you how we have always been wrong. To fear fire, earth, air, and water. Giants have come and gone, and now there are translucent salamanders. Arms held out where our friends can hear us. We loosen in this hour. We herald a breaking calm, appealing to all muscle, carrying itself toward and away until there is no center and not four directions, but the infinite way out. Okay, so this is a brand new piece that I just finished, and this was a lot of fun to do this one. The exercise is called MIA Escalator, and it's for my friends Jen Benka and Carol Mirakov. I rode several of my favorite escalators in Philadelphia, taking notes down and up the vantages. At the top and bottom of the ride, I would show photographs of myself to strangers and ask, excuse me, have you seen this person? <laughs> Sometimes there was confusion. <laughs> Isn't that you? I would reply, no. Many people think I look like her. <laughs> but have you seen her? I feel very fortunate to have been born before the ultrasound machine. My generation was the last generation to have a male and female name waiting at the other end of the birth canal. <laughs> My generation is the last to have our mothers touch their bellies, talking to us as male and female, pink or blue, both pink and blue. Have you seen this person? I enjoyed my conversations with strangers and made at least one new friend, a handsome man who knew I was the person in the photograph, that person, I am that person and agreed. The ultrasound machine gives the parents the ability to talk to the unborn by their gender, taking the intersex nine-month conversation away from the child. The opportunities limit us in our new world. Encourage parents to not know. Encourage parents to allow anticipation on either end. Escalators are a nice ride. Slowly <laughs> rising and falling while riding, taking notes for the poem, meeting new people at either end. Excuse me. Excuse me, my escalator notes became a poem. And this is the poem. It's called, I hope I'm loud when I'm dead. <laughs> I have a mannequin for a paperweight. It is difficult to type with such a large paperweight. I reach around lovers late into night typing. From behind, it is impossible to tell which is Virgil. 
Poetry can be of use. The field of flying bullets the hand reaches through. Loving the aftertaste. Finding a deeper third taste. Many are haunted by human cruelty through the centuries. I am haunted by our actions since breakfast. <laughs> you said too much poetry. I said too much war. The biggest mistake for love is straining. There was a door marked mistake. We entered. You said too much fooling around. I said fuck off and die. <laughs> so, um... This next piece I want to read is, I literally just finished for the, the Eco Poetics Conference at Berkeley that I'm um, going to be part of this weekend. Um, originally, I don't want to get into too much of the details, but I was doing a whole other project and then there's a, there's a film house named Delinquent Films and they're making a documentary about my new book, the first book that I read from. And, um, the, um, they just recently um, re-interviewed me about some, they had some follow-up questions, and uh, they, they told me that they were investigating my um, boyfriend's murder. He was murdered in Tennessee, and a lot of the police were covering it up, and they said it was a suicide, and I maintained for the last dozen years that it was a murder, and they found out that I was correct. They spoke with the coroner and they looked at the report and every single thing I said was correct. So, I'm, once I get into this, I'll just read it now and uh, the exercise. It's called, and he named himself Earth. He was an environmental activist. I loved Earth years ago. Quote, I drew a map on you so I wouldn't get lost. Unquote. Dorian O'Malley. Oh, and the other thing is I couldn't, uh, it was just too emotional. I was having a hard time writing the exercise, the prose poem. So, and I, and I love Eileen Miles, and I trust her uh, so much, and um, if you don't know her work, you really should know her poems. And um, I, I chose to write this as a letter to Eileen Miles, and it just came out within 20 minutes. So, I loved Earth years ago. Dear Eileen, every night lately I dream about Mark, my boyfriend who renamed himself Earth back when he became an environmental and AIDS activist. I no longer call his death in Tennessee a murder. I call it an execution, executed for being queer. It happened over a dozen years ago and few believed my story and the police told our mutual friends he killed himself. An execution not fit for police investigation. Just another faggot punished for breaking God's laws in this good Christian nation. I will never apologize for my anger. Delinquent Films is making a documentary about my new book, and they questioned me about Earth. They also didn't believe me, so they interviewed the sheriff who told them Earth was a suicide. Then they talked with the coroner, and he corroborated every detail I've been saying for years. Earth was hogtied, gagged, tortured, covered in gasoline, and burned to death. The coroner used the word homicide and said it's not possible this was a suicide. I'm grateful homicide was said out loud and that a film about my poems as they reason this investigation is finally going to happen. What does it take to get a faggot's execution investigated? Poems. The weight of poems has arrived. I loved him so much, my gentle, sexy man, steward of flowers and worms. I'm going to be on a panel at the Eco Poetics Conference in Berkeley with some of my favorite poets. I'm creating a somatic poetry exercise where I visit the places Earth and I love. We had a garden plot in Philadelphia, but we also planted zinnias, marijuana, cucumber, kale, cowpeas, rosemary, lemon balm, and string beans along riverbanks and in overgrown, abandoned lots. The weight of poems is upon me, so I'm selling them for a little ruthless surrender. A decade is long enough to dream of revenge for a dead lover. For seven days, I'll go to our favorite places for the poems. I'll also go on the internet to see what every ingredient I put into my body looked like when it was still growing. See fields of sesame plants while chewing their seeds. Yes. He named himself Earth when planet extinction was clearest. He wanted to spend time in Tennessee and I warned him about country people. I was born and raised in rural Pennsylvania where everyone is proud of living in the country. I noticed at a young age that these proud country people love to poison, burn, shoot, and decapitate the natural world. Their pride is mostly invested in subduing nature, always ready to prove who's boss. 
It is difficult to tell them who they really are, like convincing my stupid father to stop pouring ammonia and broken glass down the chipmunk holes. It is difficult to convince them of the harmless lives of tiny creatures who only need a few acorns and berries. I miss Earth. I loved him. I'm tired of being such a sad faggot, but say la vie. His brutal execution is a mirror of every decision to pollute air, water, soil, lungs, hearts, communities of people, birds, fish, bears, stop, 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 stop. Are you hopeful we can stop in time? Let me write some poetry to try and calm down. Love you, Eileen, and thanks for listening. So this is the poem. It's a rather long title, this poem. It's called Ariana Reigns Showed Me the World's First Guidebook was a 12th century pamphlet for pilgrims. This is my refrigerator I won on an American game show. Once in a while, I find myself looking forward instead of back. Hearing all dreamers talk at once sends me into the lower organs. I type your name on the computer, delete it, type it again, different each time. Before I met you, my favorite color was green light. Now I serve poetry to serve you. Now I am famished for peace. Now I watch a 90-year-old movie to witness dead people talking, singing, riding horses. Samsara, samsara, samsara. I've been walking the border of sleep to find you dreaming around the circumference of a hole in the ground. The bravest thing sometimes is how the morning is greeted. Fight for the money or fight for the soul, the saying goes. But another goal is to fight for neither. Drip, 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 the soul of money. The loneliness of staying too long in a gentrified neighborhood. Tension of real things that seem unreal. A door left open and the skull is a way out as a tyranny to let flow through the wires in the wall. Half the mind, half the morning kept a secret from the cooling engine of the dream. There is no job harder than setting eyes and sockets to see right. Most of your friends called you a suicide, my dear man, but I know the truth in saying I will always love you is a currency worth the length of my time here. How to Ruin the Child is chapter one of my new book, How to Ruin the Adult. So I'd like to end on, uh, by reading from the Book of Frank. <clears throat> I just found out from my publisher, Wave, that there are some Swedish poets translating this into Swedish. And uh, Ramon Lujan and Jen Hoffer just translated it into Spanish. And Carrie Hunter, who's here from Ippolita Press, published some of the German translations. And um, I just can't even believe that... Uh, all these people want to read it all over the place. Swedish is coming. I love Abba. <laughs> <laughs> when Frank was born, father inspected the small package the nurse handed him. But where's my daughter's cunt? My daughter has no cunt. Mother leaned from the bed. This is your awful son, dear. Your son has no cunt. Why doesn't my son have a cunt? What has happened? What a wicked world, dark and spinning on its one good leg. Okay, so this next one is, uh, I wrote this after reading the um, New York Times bestselling memoir of George W. Bush, <laughs> where he talked about his mother, Barbara Bush, showing him at breakfast a, um, a jar with a, a miscarried child in it, or an abortion, I forget, like at breakfast. <laughs> Frank hated the nine miscarriages kept in jars of formaldehyde. Oh. Mother burped each one, spooned peas against the glass. She rocked them all at once in her arms, no room for Frank. You are too big for a jar, my child. You will betray me the rest of your life. Mm. Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> at the dinner party, Frank lost his fruit cup. He looked under the table saw how people touch themselves, even at dinner parties. Zipper stroke, knees reacquainted with palms. His eyes clouded in jubilation. But where is Frank, they asked. While on their laps, the only answer was a tiny, mysterious violet. Oh, the burden of nouns no verb can budge, Frank said. Like what, his sister asked. Corpse, he said. Toss the corpse, let's play toss the corpse, she yelled. 
Oh, you got the corpse moving, he said. When would you learn, Frank? There is no noun a verb can't cure. Father was drunk and yelling, and rule number nine, everybody dies. Upon hearing rule number nine, Frank suddenly forgot all of the rules. Frank grew crows for hands. It was a difficult childhood. At dinner during prayer, his crows flapped excited in the name of the Lord. Frank, keep still, Mother hollered. Did you wash your crows? Did you wash your filthy, stinking crows? When Father died, Frank was found straddling him, his crows picking the seven gold fillings. Frank saw a giant eat a park bench with her vagina, drink a swimming pool with her vagina. I saw her swallow the baby and spit out the crib, Frank said. He tiptoed past her snoring uterus one night and heard a few familiar voices cry out. The Germans in particular liked that one. <laughs> <laughs> Would you sign my book, Mr. Poe? Frank asked the pile of bones and the shovels of dirt. Why, certainly, young man, answers Frank in a different voice. <laughs> this is your captain, Frank says from the cockpit. All passengers wishing to bail out any time during our flight. It is too late. I have shredded the parachutes to confetti in celebration of our arrival. <laughs> Oh, and this one, a friend of mine, um, a friend of mine got this one tattooed on her arm, and now she's visiting me soon. I'm going to take a Polaroid of the tattoo of this poem, and then I'm going to get the tattoo of the Polaroid. <laughs> <laughs> it's very short. Frank knows a butterfly who wonders about her old caterpillar friends. Hmm? That's it. Doesn't take up a lot of space. <laughs> For love, Frank spoke softly into envelopes instead of writing letters. For Jonathan Williams. Frank is grateful for the ride, but knows most truck carry semen stains. Looking for these, the driver asks, pointing to eager swimmers long since oh. dry and on radio, ashtray, cup holder. The cop followed Frank into the diner, shouting, Hey, sleazebag, your shadow's in the street on his knees blowing mine. Frank looks out the window where a crowd is gathered. <laughs> yeah, he says, they seem to be finishing up. <laughs> but no, they're just no. switching places. <laughs> At the party, everyone traced fingers on their bodies where they preferred to have cancer if they had to have cancer. Oh, the host asked Frank where he'd like to have his. What a question, Frank said. I'd like my cancer right here, and traced a circle on the host instead. <laughs> From the menu of dead authors, Frank orders Emily Dickinson's breast with dumplings and the braised thigh of an East Nin. His wife orders Leo Tolstoy's ring finger with caviar and the candy genitals of Jack Kerouac. <laughs> Kerouac's erection arrives shimmering in gravy. Mmm, she says, nibbling the tip. Frank glares and stabs a breast. Thank you. <laughs>